Hey YouTube, Ethan here. Today we're going to be talking about how radiant liquid pipes made out of different metals impacts your cooling performance in oxygen not included when using a thermal aqua tuner. If you've been following the channel for quite some time, you'll remember that I did a similar comparison video using all of the viable liquids in oxygen not included as coolants with the thermal aqua tuner. It was a similar and controlled demonstration such as this one, where we took all of the viable liquids that you would find on an asteroid, such as polluted water, salt water, and some of the more advanced liquids such as nectar, which require a little bit of processing to acquire, and supercoolant, which is not available on your asteroid at all. We also compared it to things like oil, petroleum, things that are generally not considered as great for cooling, but still definitely work when you're using extreme temperature ranges. The results of that video weren't exactly shocking. There are three main ways to cool efficiently in oxygen not included with the thermal aqua tuner. The first one's going to be supercoolant. Obviously, this is the number one choice if you're trying to cool anything in the game. But this is very hard to acquire and not practical to use early on in the playthrough because it's so hard to get. The second is going to be nectar. Nectar has almost identical performance to polluted water, but it has the benefit of having a greater temperature range that it can operate at. That leaves polluted water. Polluted water is the undisputed king when you're trying to cool anything with the thermal aqua tuner because it's so readily available. You can not only create it very easily on your asteroid with things like the carbon skimmer or your washrooms if you have to, but you usually spawn with a whole bunch of it anyways that you can use. So having come to that conclusion, we're going to be using polluted water for this demonstration. So let me explain what I have going on here. So first of all, I have my chamber of polluted water and all of the liquid pumps sucked up polluted water from this chamber. The polluted water inside of this chamber is around 0 degrees Celsius. There has been some trivial heating throughout the chamber where the liquid is sitting in, but that's not going to be consequential for our test. All of these pumps are connected to the thermal aqua tuner loop above them, and they were all enabled by automation at the exact same time in order to get the cooling loops as close to filled evenly as possible. Once the cooling loops were full, the pumps were shut off at the bottom, and because of the bypass on each thermal aqua tuner, the polluted water simply cycles this loop until cooling is requested. And this is happening for every single one of the cooling loops, except for one, and I'll explain that in just a minute. The cooling loops for each aqua tuner is your standard cooling loop cycle that you would use for any aqua tuner cooling setup. There's an inlet where a liquid pipe thermal sensor sits, and this determines whether or not the aqua tuner is going to turn on or off. Now the automation looks a little bit complicated for this demonstration, and that's only because I decided to add a signal switch and an OR gate so I could function the aqua tuners manually if I needed to. The liquid pipe thermal sensor will actually be the only thing that's controlling whether the aqua tuner is on or off, and every single one of them is set up the exact same way. So if we take a look at the temperature of the aqua tuners currently, you can see that they're all roughly 98 degrees Celsius, with very few trivial differences between them. Finally, let's take a look at the piping. All of the piping that is not made out of radiant liquid piping is made out of ceramic. Up here in these chambers, I'm going to be putting the substances that we're going to be cooling. Currently, everything is vacuumed out to try to keep everything the exact same temperature. The only thing that's different for this entire build is what the radiant liquid pipes are made of. The first chamber is made out of copper, the second is lead, cobalt, iron, aluminum, nickel, gold, tungsten, steel, iridium, mercury, depleted uranium, niobium, and thermium. Now let's discuss the mercury real quick. Solid mercury melts at minus 38 degrees Celsius. And because the polluted water that I was feeding into the radiant liquid pipes that's made out of mercury was zero degrees Celsius, it immediately reached its melting point and melted. So that's why we have no mercury piping. Let's go ahead and start cooling something with these different types of metals. In order to start this demonstration, I'm going to pause the game and we're going to fill each of the chambers that's completely vacuumed out with crude oil. And that's going to be at 50 degrees Celsius. The reason we're going to be using crude oil is because as we learned from the liquid demonstration, crude oil does not do a very good job at holding heat. It has a very low specific heat capacity, which means it's not very good as a coolant. And likewise, it's very easy to cool down if you're using a superior type of liquid, such as polluted water. Okay, so we're going to unpause the game at max speed and we're going to observe the temperature changes of the crude oil. So let's get started. So right away, you can see that the thermal aqua tuners start up and they immediately begin cooling the polluted water that is coming back through the radiant liquid pipes. Right away, after just a few seconds, we've already noticed some significant change in the temperature of the crude oil. Keep in mind that we're going to be looking at the number for the crude oil tooltip, not the radiant liquid pipe tooltip. So for the radiant liquid piping made out of copper, we're at 44.7 degrees. For the lead, we're at 46.1. For the cobalt, we're at 43.9. For iron, we're at 44.8. For aluminum, we're at 42.7. For nickel, we're at 43.9. For gold, we're at 44.9.
For tungsten, we're at 44.9. For steel, we're at 44.9. For iridium, we're at 43.7. For depleted uranium, we're at 47.1. Wow. For nobium, we're at 44.9. And for thermium, we're at 42.6. So as you can see, there is a clear winner already just after a very few seconds of running the cycle. The aluminum at 42.7 and the thermium at 42.6 are the two materials that are leading the way right now. Let's go ahead and speed up the game and run it until the very next cycle and see what the crude oil temperature is for each of the different metals. Okay, we've completed that cycle. Let's take a look at the temperature of the crude oil in all of the chambers. Copper is at 24.1. Lead is at 26.5. Cobalt is at 23.4. Iron is at 24.3. Aluminum is at 22.2. That's the leader so far. Nickel is at 23.5. Gold is at 24.3. Tungsten is at 24.2. Steel is at 24.3. Iridium is at 23.1. Depleted uranium is at 33.1. Wow, way far behind. Nobium is at 24.4. And thermium is at 22.1. So I think we have a clear winner at which metal is the best to use as your radiant liquid piping and oxygen not included if you are trying to cool a liquid. It's obvious that aluminum at 22.2 degrees is neck and neck with thermium at 22.1 degrees as the best metal to use for your radiant liquid piping. As far as second place for the second best metal and beyond, there's obviously not much difference between a lot of the other different metals. Copper seems like just as viable of a metal to use for your radiant liquid piping as something like steel is. Both of them are at 22.3 and 22.1 degrees respectively. Meanwhile, there's one metal in particular that is horrible to use and you should probably avoid it at all cost, and that is the depleted uranium piping. This is the only chamber that the crude oil is still above 30 degrees for. Everything else is at 25 degrees or below. Some commonly found metals on your asteroids such as gold and iron are all neck and neck at 24 and a fraction of a degrees. If you can find a cobalt volcano, it does slightly better at 23.4. Lead is at 26.5, so I would argue that lead is probably the worst you could use for radiant liquid piping that is going to be readily available on your asteroid. And all of the other ones like thermium, niobium, iridium, nickel, and cobalt are not as readily accessible unless you're playing on a specific DLC or asteroid configuration. So right now you may be asking, why does this matter if the results are so similar? So consider this, we only ran the demonstration for about an entire cycle, and we've seen some noticeable differences in the different types of metals being used. Obviously, some metals are a lot closer than others, and the difference between them is probably trivial. But if you stretch this demonstration across multiple cycles, and even an entire playthrough, you're going to get a lot better performance out of something like aluminum or thermium than you would out of something like lead. Even if you compare the performance of aluminum to something more standard such as gold or copper, you're still going to notice a massive difference over the course of an entire playthrough. So what does this mean? Because the cooling performance of something like aluminum is so much better than that of other metals, you're going to be able to save power with your thermal aqua tuner. So if power is a big criteria for running your base efficiently as possible, this is something that you'll want to consider. If you have no regard for power whatsoever, because you think that you're making way more than enough, you can use whatever metal that you like. Another consideration that you might want to make is that if you're trying to cool something that is very hot or very rapid temperature increases, if you need your thermal aqua tuner to work actively and very proficiently instead of passively in the background, then obviously something like aluminum is going to be the choice of metal that you need to use. On the other hand, if you're just trying to cool your main pool of water and trying to keep it around roughly 20 degrees Celsius for your bristle blossoms, then using basically any other type of metal is going to work just fine as long as it's not the depleted uranium. If you're asking your aqua tuner to work passively, you don't need to use the more aggressive types of metals. But if you want it to work quickly and efficiently and use less power, you definitely want to consider using aluminum. Since I've been going over the results, the aqua tuners have been running. So let's go ahead and take a look at the crude oil temperatures one more time before we move on to something else. The crude oil that is cooled by the radiant liquid piping made out of copper is now at 5.2 degrees Celsius. Lead is at 11 degrees Celsius. Cobalt is at 1.6 degrees Celsius. Iron is at 5.9 degrees Celsius. Aluminum takes the lead once again at minus 0.3 degrees Celsius. Nickel is at 2 degrees Celsius. Gold is at 5.1 degrees Celsius. Tungsten is at 5.1 degrees Celsius. Steel is at 5.9 degrees Celsius. Iridium is at 0.8 degrees Celsius. Depleted uranium is still at 20 degrees Celsius. Wow, definitely do not use depleted uranium. Nobium is at 5.8 degrees Celsius and thermium is at negative 0.3 degrees Celsius. 
So after another cycle, you can see that there's a much more dramatic difference between all of the different liquids. For example, there's now a much more noticeable gap between lead and aluminum and something more common such as lead versus copper. We can also see that some of the more common metals such as gold, which is at 5.1 and copper, which is at 5.2 is doing much better than a more expensive metal to produce such as steel, which is at 5.9. So once again, these results just underscore how much of an impact this would make over the course of your entire playthrough. It is worth noting that if you're playing on the Terra asteroid, you're not going to have direct access to aluminum as you would gold, copper, lead, or steel. So if this is the case, any of the standard metals that you come across on your Terra asteroid are going to perform somewhat evenly. So you can go ahead and choose whichever one you have the most of. Okay, so now that we've seen how these metals impact the cooling performance versus a liquid such as crude oil, let's go ahead and try to cool a gas. Okay, so we're back at the beginning and this time we're going to cool oxygen. If you're building a spa or a hydra and you're trying to cool the oxygen that is coming out of your electrolyzers, you might want to consider doing it the most efficient way possible, especially if you're not sending the oxygen through a dedicated cooling chamber, but you're cooling it locally at the source of the electrolyzer. So for this demonstration, we're going to fill each of the chambers with 10 kilograms of oxygen at 90 degrees Celsius. Let's go ahead and do that, and let's try to determine what the results will be beforehand. Now, as we already know, most gases, including hydrogen, do not carry a lot of heat with them when compared to liquids. It is much easier for almost any type of liquid in the game to cool any type of gas. Obviously, there's going to be differences there as well, but you can definitely get away with using even crude oil to cool gases at the cost of using more power to do so. In this situation, we've overpressurized these chambers to have 10 kilograms of oxygen on each tile, which matches the amount of liquid that is going through each pipe at also 10 kilograms. Normally, if you're trying to pump out oxygen from a spawn, it's not going to get anywhere near this amount of gas volume. So it's not going to be anywhere near as challenging to cool the oxygen before you pump it out. So keep that in mind for this demonstration. We've drastically overpressurized these chambers in order to try to find the right balance between 10 kilograms of polluted water going through the pipe and 10 kilograms of oxygen on each tile. So let's go ahead and start the demonstration. Okay, so right away we see some noticeable differences. I can pause it just seconds after starting the demonstration and we can take a look at how much variation there is in the chambers. With the temperature overlay, we can see this dramatic difference in cooling capacity of the different metals right away. But let's go take a deep dive and inspect the first tile of every single chamber. The oxygen being cooled by the radiant liquid pipe made out of copper is at 20.3 degrees. Lead is at 36 degrees. Cobalt is at 12.6 degrees. Iron is at 20.2 degrees. Aluminum is at 2.1 degrees. Once again, aluminum takes the lead. Nickel is at 9.2 degrees. Gold is at 24.2 degrees. Tungsten is at 27.3 degrees. Steel is at 22.5. Iridium is at 16.3. Depleted uranium is quite hot at 32.9 degrees. Neobium is at 23.4 degrees. And thermium, once again, is at 22.2 degrees, tied with aluminum. Actually, it's 0.1 degree behind aluminum. So once again, you can see just what a drastic difference the different types of metals make in cooling your oxygen. Now, as the simulation runs, you can see that all of the gases eventually cool to the desired temperature which is going to be determined by the liquid pipe thermosensor at one degree Celsius. Even the depleted uranium gets there quite quickly. And again, this is just because gases do not hold a lot of heat. They're incredibly easy to cool. So you don't need the most top tier metal for your radiant liquid piping in order to cool your gases. But if you're trying to cool them locally at the source of your gas pumps inside of a spawn, obviously there are gases that are going to do way better than others. Let's go ahead and do one final demonstration. In this final demonstration, we're going all out and using the absolute best cooling liquid, and that is supercoolant. This is the exact same demonstration, except I've replaced the polluted water that was at 0 degrees Celsius with supercoolant at 0 degrees Celsius. It has already been primed inside each of the liquid cooling loops, and now we're going to go ahead and add the liquids in the top chamber. In this case, we're going to be cooling water. We've already done crude oil, and we've seen the drastic differences that happen with the different types of metals. But water has a lot higher specific heat capacity than crude oil. Let's see if the supercoolant is able to make quick work of cooling down water. So we're going to pause the game and drop in 1000 kilograms of water at 50 degrees Celsius into each of the chambers. It goes without saying that mercury had the same fate when we were using supercoolant as it did with polluted water. Okay, so now that all the chambers are filled, we can see that each of the chambers has the water temperature at exactly the same range Let's go ahead, turn it to full speed, unpause the game, and see what happens. 
Okay, so the aqua tuners are going to start running right away because now we're carrying all of that heat into the aqua tuners from the water. You can see that even though we're using super coolant, water is a lot harder to cool than crude oil, just as I predicted. This is going to take some time. Let's go ahead and run it for about a cycle and see where the water temperature's at. All right, we're here a cycle later. Let's take a look at the water temperatures. We're going to pause the game and check the very first tile on each chamber once again. Starting with the radiant liquid piping made out of copper, the water is 27.7 degrees. The lead is at 34.1 degrees. A huge difference already. The cobalt is at 24.9 degrees. The iron is at 28.6 degrees. The aluminum is at 23.7 degrees, taking the lead once again. The nickel is at 25 degrees. The gold is at 27.7 degrees. The tungsten is at 27.8 degrees. The steel is at 28.9 degrees. The iridium is at 24.6 degrees. The depleted uranium is at 38.8 degrees, once again in last place. The niobium is at 28.9 degrees. And finally, thermium at 23.7 degrees. So once again, we can see that there's some dramatic differences, even when using the super coolant with the different types of metal piping. I was surprised to see that lead is so high this time versus something like copper. But what remains true is that aluminum and thermium are still the number one and definitely avoid using depleted uranium at all costs, unless you like wasting power. Now it's worth noting that super coolant freezes at negative 271.2 degrees Celsius. So this means that I could have been running these thermal aqua tuners at a much lower rate by setting the liquid pipe thermal sensors way below one degree Celsius. And that would have dramatically impacted how fast we were able to cool the water. So we could definitely get a lot more cooling performance out of the super coolant than we just did right now. Now once again, all of these different values for each of the different metals can be stretched across a very long playthrough and at that point you're going to see a much more dramatic impact on the cooling performances between the different metals than you just saw here, even though something like the lead was considerably worse than when we were using polluted water. I think this just goes to show how deep oxygen not included is with its game mechanics. There are so many different ways that you can optimize any build that you do in the entire game, whether it's cooling, heating, whether it's how you set up your thermal aqua tuners, whether it's how you extract the heat from them, and even what types of metal you're using for your piping. So keep these tips in mind for your future builds when you're trying to build cooling loops with a thermal aqua tuner. One last look at the overlay before we get to the end of the video. Once again, we can see that the depleted uranium is way far behind and the aluminum is way far ahead at 16.5 degrees. It's the only one that's starting to get a little bit blue to indicate that it's at the chilled temperature range, along with the thermium, of course. So I really hope that you enjoyed this comparison of the different types of metals that you can use for your radiant liquid piping in oxygen not included. If you did get this far in the video, be sure to leave a rating as this helps me out a ton in the algorithm. If you're not subscribed yet, please do so to see more videos like this one in the future. And if you love watching Oxygen Not Included, come hang out with me on my live streams. I try to get at least three live streams in per week, and I will always let you know in the community tab when the live stream is happening. I very rarely go on without a notification first. So keep an eye out on the community tab for more information. As always, thank you to all the supporters who have been with me from the beginning of the channel, and of course, everyone who's subscribed since then. Thank you so much for your support, it means a ton to me. I love making these videos and I really appreciate your support in watching these videos. So until the next time, I'm Ethan and I'll talk to you guys in the next video.